Hello, and welcome to The Advantaged Investor, a Raymond James Limited podcast that provides perspective for Canadian investors who want to remain knowledgeable, informed, and focused on long-term success. We are recording this on May 23rd, 2024. I'm Chris Cooksey from the Raymond James Corporate Communications and Marketing Department. And today, Robin Tobe, is a, who is a chartered professional accountant, a keynote speaker, and a best-selling author is joining us. Her latest award-winning book, The Wisest Investment, Teaching Your Kids to Be Responsible, Independent, and Money Smart for Life, gives parents the information, strategies, and inspiration they need to teach their kids about money. Welcome to The Advantage Investor, Robin. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. It's a beautiful sunny day in Toronto. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Looking forward to our talk. Awesome. Now, as we both know, financial literacy in general and probably education on personal finances generally is non-existent in the country, uh, at least in a formal setting. Obviously, there are individuals like yourself and, you know, maybe some companies that do some things. But in general, it seems to be something that uh, the education system lacks, I would I would suggest. Um, and, um, you know, well, as, so go ahead. Can I, can I push back a little sure, bit on that? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, actually, in Canada, uh, financial literacy is being taught across the country in every province and territory. It's going to it is different um, depending on where you live because education is a provincial, uh, you know, it's a provincial thing right. or territorial thing. But in Ontario, for example, where I live, uh, financial literacy is being taught in school. Um, for the last at least 10 years, it's been integrated into the curriculum. And there are also a lot more now standalone classes. So, for example, um, in grade 10 careers, they have a module on financial literacy. In British Columbia, for example, they've had a course called Planning 10 that's been around for a really long time. Um, I actually uh, create we created a map that shows all the different teachings that's that are going on in Canada and as I said some are mandatory some are elective uh, and we posted that on LinkedIn in November 2023 which was financial literacy month so I think a lot of people think like you do that it isn't being taught formally um, which means maybe it's not being taught effectively and that's where parents come in but it is happening in school yeah, I have I have three kids, uh, two who are recently graduated and one who is going to be graduating this year. And mm-hmm. I, I mean, unless it happened sort of on the down low and now COVID probably took it because I mean, I don't know that education was that serious during COVID. Uh, but the um, so uh, right. it's good to hear that it's actually moving forward then, because I know when I was growing up, it did not exist um, and it wasn't really taught at all. So but that is this is such an important thing on how someone, quote unquote, turns out, if you will, um, having mm-hmm. a. I would suggest that we probably learn our money habits from our parents a lot of times. That can be a very positive thing, but it also uh, could probably be a very negative thing, wouldn't you think? Well, for sure. (laughs) And one of my strategies for for parents that are trying and want to teach their kids is to try to get their own financial house in order Mm. first so that they can lead by example and be good financial role models for their kids. Because whether you're aware of it or not, you are a role model for your kids, including with money. So they are picking up the things that you do and say and your habits. So it's it's really worth the effort to try and model them because habits are sticky. You know, they create yeah. these neural pathways that are difficult to change. So you want to try you want your kids to try and establish good habits early in life. Oh. Totally makes sense. I've told my kids that if uh, if they become productive members of society with good sort of some financial some financial background or some ideas on how to you know balance their checkbook or to talk old school uh, or or pay mm-hmm. off their credit cards or whatever, uh, then my mm-hmm. job uh, uh, one of my big jobs I was successful at. So um, um, I'm yeah. glad I'm glad to hear that. At least we're moving forward in that way. Yeah, and those are are two good examples. Like maybe like you said, not not using a checkbook anymore, but just like <laughs> knowing where you stand. Yeah being aware of, you know, how much money you have, like what you own, what you owe, uh, your cash flow and your net worth. And then, like you said, um, good habits, like paying your your credit card balance off monthly, you know, not the minimum payment, but yeah. ideally the full amount and using credit responsibly. Yeah. 
And, 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 and like we said, it's just so important for their future. So uh, we do have a lot to get into. So if you're ready, let's uh, sure. we'll jump into the more formal aspect of this. And why don't we start with who is Robin and uh, your background and why you got into this um, sort of sure. side of financial planning, if you will. Right. So I'm um, actually, you know, not a financial planner, a CFP, but I am a chartered professional accountant, as you mentioned in the introduction. So my background is that when I uh, graduated from university, I went and worked at one of the big four accounting firms, KPMG. Um, I spent a couple of years there. My clients were mostly financial institutions. And then I transitioned to a mid-sized firm that ended up merging with Ernst & Young. <laughs> and I specialized in tax when I was there. I ended up leaving there to go work for one of their clients who was doing real estate syndication. And from there, I ended up leaving uh, accounting, really, and working at Citibank Canada and derivatives marketing. So I've had a broad range of experience in uh, the worlds of accounting and finance and always had an interest in personal finance. And the way that the uh, you know financial literacy came to be my focus was I was um, volunteering on a committee for CPA Canada, which is the governing body. And it was to do with women's leadership. But at the time, it was around 2008, right after the global financial crisis. And they had done some research that showed that parents were really struggling with teaching their kids about money. And the research found that 78% of parents had tried to teach their kids, but two thirds didn't feel they'd been particularly successful and more than half didn't know what information they needed. Mm. So they approached me because they knew I had kids and they knew I, uh, I had some media experience. So they approached me and asked me if I was interested in writing this book to help parents teach their kids about money. So that's really the genesis of it. Uh, and really from there, I just started focusing on creating financial content, the book, you know, speaking, but I also work, have worked with a lot of uh, financial services companies over the years, creating financial content for them to use in their content marketing uh, initiatives, right. as well as just campaigns and collaborations. Great. So sort of sort of a passion of yours then, uh, as, as you found it, uh, I guess, it would be a way to put yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it's something I've always, um, you know, been interested in myself. I think it's an it's an outcrop of having a you know financial background, applying it to your personal hmm. life as well. And something that I always felt my kids needed as they were growing up. I knew that this was an essential life skill yeah. um, to be able to manage money because you're going to be doing that for the rest of your life and you want to be able to make responsible financial decisions at every stage. Right. And so my next, I was just going to bring up, you know, if someone asks you, Robin, what is the, wh why is financial literacy important? You just sort of answered some of that there. It, it is a life skill that is necessary in order to, to make your way through life, whether that's getting a mortgage or whatever, a car loan or just buying your groceries. Yes. So, I mean, I, I obviously like to say that it's the wisest investment you can make is to teach your kids about money. And the reason it's so important is both from the children's perspective as well as the parents. Mm. So from the kids' perspective, like we said, it's a basic life skill. You're going to need it. Um, financial literacy means having the knowledge, skills, and confidence to make responsible financial decisions throughout your life. So everyone needs that. Uh, the second reason is um, financial stress, money worries, are the greatest source of stress for Canadians and Americans for the sixth year in a row. Wow. So that's more than health or work or relationships. And money stress can lead to physical issues like high blood pressure and heart disease, as well as other ailments like autoimmune issues, migraines, um, and mm obviously mental health issues like stress and anxiety. So we want our kids to not have to go through that if they have some, you know, some, some financial skills. We want them to not have money worries if possible. And then the other thing we touched on too was, was we just, we don't want our kids to develop bad habits, like living beyond their means that become mm -hmm. difficult to break as they get older. So those are from the kids' perspective. And then sure. as parents, I think, you know, the research shows that most Canadians can't afford to support their adult children financially. And if they do, then um, some are willing to do so, even if it could jeopardize their own financial future. Hmm. 
And then at the other end of the spectrum, if if a family has a lot of means and wealth, um, you know, sometimes they don't want to, um, they want to still ensure that their kids have these skills because they don't want to encourage dependency with with the, with the money that they have. They want their kids to to know how to be good stewards of wealth, to be responsible, to be financially mature and have these skills to, to manage the money that they may inherit one day. That's interesting too, because I mean, it's easy to think about like, you don't want to go bankrupt. So learn about money, but the physical and sort of health related things is probably something that doesn't get enough attention. Um, not to mention, I bet you there's more than one couple that ended up going their separate ways due yeah, to financial reasons. Yes. Getting on the same page is also really important. Um, as you said, for like harmony in the relationship and also in terms of um, presenting a united front mm. for your children. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. So lack of financial planning education, as we talked off the start, I'm glad to hear the education system is is finally moving forward. I've, I've I, Even when I was in high school and I wasn't a big school guy, uh, I often thought that, you know, a course on this would be very beneficial. Um, you get to university if you go to post-secondary and there's all sorts of credit card companies only happy yeah. to provide you with a credit card, go to the bar, have some fun. And then mm-hmm. of course they don't really teach you. Uh, you know, you do that a couple of times and buy a few rounds if you will. And, uh, and maybe this is not the way it is anymore. I'm speaking of my own. Education. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is. They still, I mean, you said your kids are graduating high school, so yeah. they haven't gone. So if you take them to university, maybe uh, for a tour or when they, when they go, if they're, you'll, you'll be amazed that those credit card companies are still out there. And they have ambassadors too. And they, you know, their goal is to get you to sign up and you use a credit card. And as you say, a lot of teenagers, if you haven't taught them or they haven't learned themselves, they're very naive. And it just seems like, you know, free money. Like, ooh, yeah. I'm so sophisticated. I have this card and I can use it to pay for things. But you're just borrowing money in the short term with a credit card. You know, yeah. you do have that grace period. If you pay it in full on the payment date, no interest. But, right. you know, you are borrowing money. So if you don't do that, then, interest is going to kick in. And and a lot of teenagers or even young adults are naive to this fact. So yes, that is like a great example. Um, and credit card debt is something that can get out of hand quite easily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, how do you, how do you start uh, with this? Is this like, mm-hmm. obviously, um, you know, you have a three-year-old, you're not, you get three grapes and I want two grapes and here's your tax. <laughs> you don't do that sort of thing. I wouldn't <laughs> imagine. Uh, but like, how do you get started? Uh, I've heard people say that they use their Halloween candy to teach their kids about taxes. (laughs) Um, Okay. Well, I have had many people tell me that, you know, they have really young kids like under five and those kids are interested in money. Normally I suggest to parents and the book kind of starts at age five. So for young kids, five to eight, some kids will express curiosity about money or an interest earlier, and that's fine. That That's your cue that they're ready to learn. But for most, let's say it's around age five to eight, and that's around the time where they start to go to preschool. They're around other kids. They see what other kids have and do, and they may start asking questions. They're also with you, and you're always using money in some form, often digital. Mm-hmm. So that's really the ideal time to start. Because you want to start when your kids are young and build on those lessons as they get older, because, you know, they can make mistakes when the stakes are low and learn from those mistakes. If, if you start teaching them when they're young, like with your credit card example, if you wait until they're that age and you don't know anything about money, they could get into a bit of trouble. Yeah, that ma- that makes sense. Uh, the totally the Halloween candy uh, is uh, is an interesting <laughs> interesting way to do it. We just uh, in our house used to just take it when they were asleep and they didn't even realize it. Was, <laughs> they were budgeting. Um, now, um, so five to eight, the, you, you're getting into the basic concepts, I imagine. Um, so, how do you start transitioning into more complicated uh, mm-hmm. situations as they age? So, the way uh, the framework that I've created that I think is really helpful for parents to make this feel less overwhelming is that there are five essential topics, which I call the five pillars of money. And those are earn, save, spend, share, and invest. So, first you have to earn money, and then you can choose how you want to save it, spend it, share it, and invest it. So those five topics never change. They're foundational, but the the uh, specific examples or family discussions or 
uh, the learning under each of those five does change as your kids get older and more sophisticated. And you always want to share age appropriate information with your children. So what you would teach a five year old or about saving is going to be really different than what you would teach a 17 year old and Mm. the same for every one of those five pillars. So that's how you do it. You really build on what came before and make sure the information that you're sharing is age appropriate. Right. And I guess too, it's important, like it's a wide ranging discussion because one thing I've talked to my kids about is you make money, like spend some money, like you've earned it. You should reward yourself. But you know, if you're making whatever, $500 a month, don't, don't, don't go on a trip that month because it's, you're going to blow through that. So, you know, that accurate way to, to balance the saving and the future versus, you know, living in the now type right. thing. Yeah. You want them to start to think that way as soon as they start earning money. And that could mean with a job for a teenager, but even if you're giving your children allowance, if they're younger and they're not really able to work yet, you still want them to go through the, that thought process about, well, you know, I need to save some because I have a goal. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to spend some because there's always things that your kids want, needs and wants. Mm-hmm. And then you want to encourage them to share some to help others and to put some away for the long term to invest it. So I agree, like the the earlier they can experience that, the more meaningful it will be. And especially if they are working um, or you're giving them an allowance that they have ownership over, they're going to think longer and harder about these decisions. And they're going to experience the fact that money's a finite resource right. and that you have to make choices and live with the consequences. Now, um, if you are living in, in close proximity to other family, or I guess you don't even really need to do that, live close anymore. Um, can the whole family get involved? Grandparents, parents, like, is that is that uh, a good strategy as well? Yes. I mean, they do often, as you said, like, even if they don't live close, it's so common to receive birthday money Mm. uh, from a grandparent or money for holidays. And, and if if the grandparents are involved in the children's lives, and they do live close, then they can play a really important role. I think the, uh, what can get a little bit tricky is just making sure the grandparents and the parents are on the same page because often the grandparents, they've done all the hard work of raising their own kids. Now they have grandchildren. They want to enjoy them. They want to spoil them. And that can undermine the lessons that the parents are trying to teach those grandchildren, Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, their own children, the grandchildren. And, you know, so that you want to make sure that you're communicating with your, your own parents, the grandparents about what you're trying to do and so that they don't kind of undermine some of those things. That, that, that makes sense. Totally. Um, now I would imagine like, obviously it's important when they're younger, but like when they get to be in that teenage moving to young adult stage, it probably gets more important as it goes on. And you talked about the five pillars and maybe mm-hmm. it is five. I was going to ask, you know, what are the three most important things a teenager or a young adult can do? But if it's five, then five, but, uh, you know, what, what advice would you provide there? I agree that the teenage stage, I feel like that's when that's a really crucial stage uh, because they have to decide what they're doing. Are they going to go on to university or college or trade vocation? Are they going to start working? And, you know, then they're really going to be making some harder decisions about investing in their education or or working and maybe moving out and, and having to manage a household budget. So, I mean, yes, I believe really there are these five pillars. I mean, you do hear sometimes three, which is basically just like earning, saving and spending. But I don't think you can really forget about the other two, which Mm. are sharing and investing. So I think at that stage, um, preparing, as I said, to go to university or college is a really big part of your financial education and financial management. And that hopefully starts early because maybe uh, as parents, you've, you've invested in some money in an RESP that you're going to withdraw. Um, you also just have to figure out like, how, how are you paying for that? So some of it might come from that RESP. Is your child going to work during university or college? What skin do they have in the game? Because I think that's a really important thing that they do, Mm. uh, have responsibility for some of their school budget or maybe all of it in some cases. It's just, you really need to sit down and have that money talk. That's like a really important 
phase and stage to talk to your kids about a budget. And again, hopefully as teenagers, they had a simple budget that they were using, but it becomes more important when, especially if they're going out of town and they have right. to manage a, a, like a household for the first time. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, how my eldest uh, is going the trade route um, and he started getting his paycheck. And, um, you know, he said to me one day, I can't believe how much money goes to my expenses, uh, you know, including taxes and that sort of thing. And I was like, oh. well, welcome to life. Uh, that's the way it goes. The paycheck uh, shock. Yes. So First how do you, paycheck how do you, shock. Yeah, yeah. That totally makes sense. So how do you have that conversation to, to prepare them? Because I think everybody, the first time they get a paycheck is like, who the heck is CPP and why are they taking my money? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, that's a great example of a teachable moment, which is another strategy I encourage parents to take advantage of, which is use these opportunities from your day-to-day -day life to teach your children a money lesson. So if your child was working as a teenager, then uh, they may have received a paycheck then, or maybe it's now when they're pursuing their career. So yes, you want to sit down and show them. Now, they may not get a physical check and a pay stub anymore like we did, long time ago, might all be digital, but still it's, there's going to be a breakdown. So yep. you do have to explain that income tax is withheld at source. That's the, the technical term, meaning it is taken directly off your gross pay and sent to the Canada Revenue Agency so that when you file your tax return, you have already paid tax. Mm -hmm. They're not going to wait around <laughs> for the end of the year. They want their tax up front. So that's what that is. And then, as you mentioned, there's not just income tax. There's also deductions for the Canada Pension Plan, CPP, and Employment Insurance, mm -hmm. EI. So you want to explain what those things are as well. And in the book, I do get into what, you know, a simple explanation for what those things are so your kids understand what they're paying into. I mean, depending where they work, they may also have the opportunity to um, save in like a group RSP, maybe the right. company even matches that. So you want to look at that as well and see if there's opportunities for them to really boost their savings by taking advantage of the kind of matching program. But yes, it's such a, an important um, teachable moment, the paycheck. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned digital a couple times, and yeah. uh, uh, I'm of an age where, you know, digital is new uh, compared to, to how I grew up. And, and so have things changed with digital or is it just the same but different? It's changed. Okay. Definitely. When I first wrote this book about 13 years ago, it was pre, I would say pre-digital times. And when I updated it, it was in the, you know, post post-digital, post-pandemic time. So right. things have really changed a lot. And in terms of, and, and the pandemic really accelerated the use of digital, if you recall, no one wants yep. to touch money, physical money. So I still encourage parents with young kids to start with cash because it is tangible and concrete and having a piggy bank is still a great way to teach kids about money. And you can even get these multi-slotted piggy banks now that have four slots for spending, saving, sharing, and investing. So they've evolved as well. But really, realistically, as soon as they open a, a bank account, a youth account, they're going to get a debit card. Right. And then they're going to be able to withdraw cash, but they're going to be able to spend using that debit card. They're going to either, you know, in stores or online. So it's really important to, tr to teach them that even though it's, you're not handing over cash where there's like that visceral sense of loss. Like you're actually mm. get, you know, losing something when it's digital, it just doesn't have that same feeling. Yeah. So you have to bring that feeling back. And some of the ways you can do that are by leveraging these digital tools. So as you know, in Canada, all the banks have these built in, they have mobile banking with a lot of built in tools like tracking tools to help track your spending, categorize it, create budgets, notifications, and alerts. So using those tools can help bring some of that awareness back, especially on the spending side, because right. spending has become so frictionless. Mm. It's so easy to spend with tapping your card, your phone. Uh, so you want to try and bring back some of that friction by reminding yourself, setting a notification, uh, or even on your smart on your watch, if you have one of those, you'll get pinged every time you spend money. Um, but it also helps you know what's going on. Like it's so easy to check on your phone and see what's my balance. When's my, my visa due? How much, um, 
you know, what are my upcoming bills? Like it really does help you have more control over your money if you use these tools. And for our kids, they're so comfortable with digital tools and they're on their phone a lot. So I think that, that, you know, just show them a little bit and then they'll figure a lot of it out on their own. They'll be teaching you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely there. (laughs) Now, uh, before we close here, maybe just uh, talk about the book a bit and uh, you know, where people can get it and that sort of stuff. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris. So the book is called The Wisest Investment, Teaching Your Kids to Be Responsible, Independent, and Money Smart for Life. It really is written for parents um, to help them teach their kids about money. Parents who feel like they may not have um, the knowledge or maybe they're not doing a great job themselves. This will really help put them at ease and give them the information that they need, what to talk about at every age and stage under those five pillars of money that we talked about. And the first chapter really is for parents to help them get their financial house in order. I talk about 11 healthy habits of financial management. And then the next four chapters are for each of the different age groups we touched on, like young kids, preteens, teens, and young adults. It's a quick, easy read. Um, And it's available on all online bookstores. Um, If you go to thewisestinvestment.com, there's a link to where you can purchase it. Uh, Most people do buy it on Amazon but there are other online book retailers that carry it. Awesome. And your last name is spelled T-A-U-B. If people are looking for that, uh, yes. just to make sure uh, uh, we have thank that. You. So Robin Taub, Taub. And uh, I want to thank you today, Robin. I took some notes uh, so my kids can look forward to avoiding me this weekend so they don't have to hear about them, but uh, I will win as I often do. Uh, but thank you very much okay. for taking the time today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you. Reach out to us at AdvantageInvestorPod at RaymondJames.ca. Subscribe to The Advantage Investor on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please contact your advisor with any questions you have. On behalf of Raymond James and The Advantage Investor, thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay well. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Statistics and factual data and other information are from sources Raymond James Limited believes to be reliable, but their accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Information is furnished on the basis and understanding that Raymond James Limited is to be under no liability whatsoever in respect thereof. It is provided as a general source of information and should not be construed as an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any product and should not be considered tax advice. Raymond James advisors are not tax advisors and we recommend that clients seek independent advice from a professional advisor on tax related matters. Securities related products and services are offered through Raymond James Limited member of the Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, which is not a member of Canadian Investor Protection Fund.